Hey, welcome to the Mike Santiago Show presented by Compassion International. On this episode, we have Pastor Aaron Burke from Radiant Church, one of Outreach Magazine's fastest growing churches in America. We're going to talk about scaling, how to grow your church or business. What's the process? What's the system look like? Also, one of your questions about how to sermon prep, all that and more on this week's episode. Let's get started. I want to highlight a ministry that I have loved for so many years. I can remember back when my wife and I raised our hand at a big conference to sponsor a Compassion Child. And Compassion is an incredible organization, and it's all about releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. They currently serve over 2 million children and families in some of the most poverty-stricken areas in the world. And my favorite part. All of this is happening through and in the local church. Compassion is all about equipping the local church so every single child is cared for by leaders in their community. And as a pastor, I found Compassion to be a strategic part of our global missions strategy. As a church, we've incorporated Compassion into our focus on Guatemala. Compassion made it easy for everyone in our church to put their faith in action by caring for a child in need. I would encourage any pastor listening to learn more about Compassion. You can help equip local churches around the world while seeing your own church grow in the process. Uh, the link for that is Compassion.com slash Mike. That's Compassion.com slash Mike to learn more. Hey, welcome back to the Mike Santiago Show, wherever you're listening or watching from today. just want to say thanks all of those that are joining us from YouTube. Welcome, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you're, Google Play Store, wherever you're at. Thanks so much for joining us. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about growing our church or business from scratch. In case you don't know our story, um, my wife and I moved from Florida to North Carolina with only uh, like two nickels in our pockets and a dream on our hearts to start a church from scratch, meaning uh, we moved to a city that we had never been to before. The term is parachuting in, meaning we were dropped off. Uh, We didn't have a large sending church. We didn't have uh, uh, jobs lined up. We had no health insurance lined up. We started from zero. And I got a job at the local Panera Bread, $7.25 an hour, and just trying to provide for my family. Three kids, all three in diapers. And as you can imagine, starting from scratch, anything, whether it's a business or a church, is so, so challenging. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about scaling up. And we started with seven people in our living room. Now we're one church with multiple locations and uh, about to do... Uh, several million dollars in real estate transactions for our church to become debt-free, and it's unbelievable. It's scaled up, and it's not scaled up because of anything I've done. Obviously, all glory to God, but we've learned so much along the way that I thought it would be important to look at what it takes to grow your organization. What does it take to scale and grow? How do we go from seven people in a living room to uh, a thousand people on a Sunday in 10 years? And I think that it's important that you realize that it, uh, one of my friends said this, if it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, it's up to me, meaning I'm responsible for scaling uh, our organization. The size of our organization is severely limited by my limitation, as we've spoken about before. But I also think that it's our job as leaders to understand the vision and direction and intention that we are dealing with. And it's so important that when you go to grow a church, that you not grow it with the wrong motives. We didn't build this church to build the church. We built this church to build the kingdom. And so our motives are always pure. Our vision has never changed. Our venue has changed immensely. Uh, Many times we went from our living room to the Holiday Inn Express (laughs) conference room where the kids were just in the in the breakfast area (laughs) for child care. We we met at a, a, a little elementary school where the toilets were micro sized elementary sized toilets. Uh, We went to a cultural arts center. Uh, We went to a high school. We got evicted from the high school. We went to a a country club, and we rented out their little banquet hall, and we only lasted there for three weeks until we got kicked out of there. Then we went to a friend friend of mine's church on Saturday nights, and then we merged with another church, and we've been all over the place. We meet in a movie theater. We meet in a leased uh, warehouse space, and now we have our own property at a location. And I think the, the moral of the story here is in order to scale, You must be willing to take major risk. If you're not willing to take major risk, the chances of you ever scaling to the next level is are are not likely. Every time we've ever stepped out in faith, every time we've ever taken a risk 
God has met us in a huge way. I meet a ton of guys who are trying to calculate every single step, every single worst case scenario, every single best case scenario. They're trying to account for every penny, every dollar. They need every team member in place, every department stacked full of equipped leaders. And that's just not how it works. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I was married and I wasn't ready to be married. And when I found out that my wife was with child, we weren't ready to be parents. There are some things in life that you just have to believe for and then step into. And so a lot of the issues with not scaling is that uh, you have the fear of failure because you don't have all of the the picture, the full picture hasn't been revealed, but that's what great leaders do. Great leaders step out in faith. Great leaders have a vision that is bigger than what they can currently see. Great leaders understand that in order to scale, we might fail. In order to scale, we might fail, but that's okay because we are going to take the risk. We are not going to be known for playing it safe. Organizations, churches that grow, never play it safe. I remember telling people, you know, this God's going to build this church. It's going to be a big church. We're going to reach the city. And in my mind, I could have never uh, articulated the narrative that played out in this whole process of scaling over the past 10 years, but I knew that something was going to happen. I think a, a lot of times guys limit themselves by not wanting to take risk. They want to have it all figured out. They want to have every detail mapped out, and that's just not how it works. Another thing is you you always think that you don't have the team. I just don't have the team. I just don't have, I hear this all the time. I just cannot find the team. I just can't find the team. If I could find the team, I could build the dream. If I could find the team. And here's the deal. Great leaders are not found. They're formed. You got to build the team. You don't find the team. You build the team. And when you build the team, the dream follows. Many guys will not scale up because they're waiting for, you know, Prince Charming leadership team to show up with a a theology degree and creative ideas. You want someone that has, you know, 30 years experience, but still has the creativity of a young person. You're looking for a, a Frankenstein of a leader, a unicorn of a leader that doesn't exist. In order to scale, you need to build with what you have. You need to steward with what, what you have, and you need to not wait to go find leaders. You need to form leaders. How do I know this? Well, I know this because the God of the universe, the one who put the stars in the sky, the one who set the earth in motion, the one who understands, who separated the waters from the earth. I mean, the one who created all human beings, sent his son Jesus down to earth. And what does his son have to do when he comes on the scene in public ministry? He doesn't go find leaders. He has to form leaders. And he walks along the shore and he picks up guys and develops them. He picks up guys and disciples them. Who are we to think that we're going to be given a pre-assembled, pre-packaged set of high-capacity, five-star leaders that just get shipped to our house next day, Amazon Prime? God does not Amazon Prime good leaders. It's our job to develop them. So in order to scale, you need to be able to take risk. In order to scale, you need to also build a team. It's Interesting what happens when you start building a team is you start to disperse the dream and the weight of the dream instead of falling only on your shoulders, the weight of the dream instead of only falling on your uh, your plate, on your office, it starts to be distributed. So people start taking ownership. People start taking responsibility. We're taking a risk as a team and we're going to scale. We're taking a risk as a team, and we're going to start that other location. We're taking a risk as a team, and we're going to start a second service. We're taking a risk as a team, and we're going to go all in with this new strategy. We're taking a risk as a team, and we're going to shut down some of these ministries, and we're going to start up some new ones. If you want to scale, you must take a risk, and you must take a risk as a team. The next thing you need to do is you need to have a vision for the future. It's not just, I need to, to scale. Why do we need to grow this church? That's going to be a question that you're going to get from uh, a lot of old time Christians. They're going to say, well, why do we need, I like the church the way it is. Why do we need to grow? That's where vision comes in. You don't need to grow the church. We actually have a vision to grow the church because our city, our city is, is in need of a savior. And so what's the vision? Well, the vision is not to build a big church for ourselves. The, the vision is for the single mom who needs a place to take their children to learn about God and to grow in her faith and to grow in their faith, have, have a place. That's why we need to do this. And so if you're going to scale your church, you need to know this. It's going to require risk. Many of you listening to this, you're probably one 
risk away from breakthrough. You're probably one risk away from taking that big step and you need to do it. The next thing you need to do is you need to build a team. Many of you are doing it by yourself and that's one of the reasons why you can't grow to the next level is because it's going to take a team. If Jesus himself could not do it, he did it by himself by dying on the cross. He was the only one to die on the cross, but he was not the only one to do the ministry. Even when he feeds the 5,000, he disperses the, the people. He says, sit down in groups of 50, and then he, he prays for the meal, but then he the distribution mechanism for that miracle was the team. And he could have miraculously filled the stomachs of all of the hungry people listening to him preach. He's the God of the universe. He is Jesus. But that's not what he does. He uses a team. And what I believe many churches lack is the pastor's the primary caregiver. The pastor's the primary communicator. The pastor's the only leader. The pastor's the only one with the keys. And when he walks in the building, the keys jingle. He unlocks the door. He locks the door. He's the first one there, last one to leave. And if you don't distribute responsibility, it will never scale up. You'll never meet someone that leads a large organization that hasn't taken some risk and built a team. Then you got to learn to cast vision. You need to have clarity for the future, as much clarity as you have. And there probably is going to be some gaps, but that's where the vision comes in. And you just say, until until we know otherwise, this is where we're going. Until we do otherwise, this is what we got to do. We got to close this down. We got to shut this down. And we are going to move forward. Another thing about scaling is you have to know that it's okay to start small. It's just not okay to stay small. It's okay to start small but it's not okay to stay small. The kingdom of God is meant to be expanded. It's meant to grow. It says in the book of Acts, 3,000 people were added to the number on one day. So don't bring to me like, oh, well, we're just going to be a house church forever. No, even if, even if you're called to a house church model, can you expand territory? Can there be more houses? If you're called to a coffee shop model, can there be more coffee shops? Multiplication is at the heart of of everything God does. He wants the kingdom of God to expand. So in order to scale it, you need to be able to take risk. You need to build a team. You need to cast a vision. And then you need to be willing to act on that vision very, very soon. Hey, let's face it. Fundraising is challenging and 90% of wealth in the United States of America is tied up in non-cash Assets. This means that churches that are only accepting cash donations are missing massive giving potential. Overflow is here to help. Overflow is an online software that empowers donors to give crypto and stock donations to churches, nonprofits within minutes. Listen, the average donation to a church that doesn't accept stock or crypto is about $128, but the average donation through Overflow is $10,000. Your donors want to give stock and crypto because it's the most tax efficient way to give. Why? Because there's no capital gains tax. So churches get the full donation and donors get the full tax deduction. As a result, churches that have churches have seen up to 32 times return on their investment with overflow. So let's unlock unprecedented generosity together by going to overflow.co slash Mike. That's overflow.co slash Mike. All right, this segment of the show is where we take a look at some of your questions. This one came across my desk recently. You can head on over to the Mike Santiago Show listener fan page there on Facebook. But this one says this, here I am again as a new lead pastor, and I'm frustrated at this point again because I'm losing my Saturdays with my family. I've continued to allow other things to push off my sermon prep, and I'm getting things ready for tomorrow. He wrote this on a Saturday. I've always struggled with procrastination, but especially in this current season that I am in, Monday through Thursday, no matter how much I try to say, it's still not going to happen. I put off my sermon prep till Saturday because everything else in the church needs me during the week, and I've only got Saturday to prepare. We're a small church, and there's one other part-time staff person, kids in bookkeeping, um, so pretty much all Sunday stuff is on me, including the worship. Many Sundays, I'm not doing my own slides until Sunday morning at 6 a.m. What are some practical things I can do to fix this? And I'm considering taking Monday and Tuesday as my day, taking Monday and Tuesday as my day off to try and fix this. Great question. Thanks for asking. Recently, I've struggled with the same thing. First of all, for many years, I've been a Saturday night prepper. 
I've taken Friday off and then a half day Saturday and then got into the office around 2 p.m. on Saturdays to wrap up the message and prepare the sermon. Recently, something changed that has really transformed the way that I Sabbath and the way that I take time off and the way that I prepare the sermon. Number one thing about Sabbath is if you work with your mind, you need to Sabbath with your hands. Meaning if you are reading books, theology, thinking, decision-making, working with your mind, you need to be working with your hands on your day off. Meaning hunting, fishing, uh, yard work, landscaping, moving bricks, building something with your hands. Now, if you work with your hands, like you are a mechanic, you are a rancher, you are a farmer, you are uh, someone that works with their hands, then you need to Sabbath with your mind. You need to have a day of rest where you read and reflect. And so if you work with your hands, Sabbath with your mind. If you work with your mind, Sabbath with your hands. Now, here's what we've done recently. Recently, I've been forced into preaching on Thursday nights. One of our locations is currently without internet, so they can't stream the service live. I have to preach on Thursday night as if it was Sunday morning. And it really, as frustrating as it can be on Thursday to kind of get ready and get prepared and be Sunday ready by Thursday, I will tell you this, it has increased the joy of my weekend. My Friday and Saturday are full uh, of family time and rest because now I have already I've already preached the sermon once on Thursday. Doesn't mean it doesn't get better between Thursday and Sunday, but it's already out. It's already on paper. The notes have already been written. The notes have already been printed. The slides are already done and it frees me up. So here's what I would do if I were you. I would say I'm going to create an online campus. And that online campus gets their sermon on Thursday night. And so online, the sermon that online sees isn't a weird angle of your current Sunday morning service with bad audio and bad video. Instead, you're going to build a video sermon just for online, and you are going to have that done by Thursday night. Once you do that, once you get the sermon out once, the relief that comes from that helps you have a better weekend and helps you to be able to prepare your sermon, to be able to preach your sermon way better. My Sunday sermons are better because I forced myself to preach it on Thursday night. There you go. Hey, we all know that digital marketing is so hard. Let's be honest, you're not great at it and neither am I. And just because your youth pastor can open up Microsoft Publisher with clip art doesn't make them a great graphic designer or a great digital marketer. Let's be honest, let's trust the guys at rocket.media to help you grow your church. They can get you more first-time guests through organic search and through paid search on Google. Uh, they can help market your big weekends like Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day on Facebook and Instagram. They've already invited over 25 million people to church using Google ads, and they've helped us launch our third location. Our south location was launched with over 400 people in attendance. You need to go ahead and sign up today. All you have to do is go to the rocket.media forward slash church. That's the rocket.media forward slash church. You get a free consultation that you can set up and you can mention us and you get some free AirPods if you sign up. So that's a great deal. Head on over to the rocket.media forward slash church. Hey, welcome to the Mike Santiago Show, sponsored by Compassion International and Overflow.co. So glad you're with us today. For today's portion of uh, the podcast, I have my friend, Pastor Aaron Burke. He is an incredible friend, an incredible leader, an incredible pastor, and it's a privilege to have him on the show today. Known him for many years, he pastors Radiant Church in Tampa, Florida. It's one church in many locations. Outreach Magazine named them the top, one of the top five churches in America several years back. And uh, we're so grateful to have you on the show today. We're going to be talking about scaling your organization, whether you lead a church, a business, whether you're just getting started or you've been in it a long time. We always want to scale up. And so, Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so honored to be with you. Mike Santiago, you are my hero. This is uh, one of the best podcasts. You're just the best of the best. Anything Mike does, I like to be part of it. So well, I'm, I'm very grateful. Tell me a little bit about how you've scaled your church. Let's start with your story, and then we'll move into the practical ways uh, that we can do that ourselves. Yeah, so 2013, my wife and I, we moved to Tampa. We didn't know anybody. We just knew we wanted to plant a church in the city and want to be here the rest of our life. So we started in a rundown dollar theater and uh, had 348 people show up to our first service, which was awesome. About half of them stayed, ended up being about 175. And then uh, God gave me kind of a unique strategy for just kind of relaunching the church every three to six months and uh, did that. 
And since then, the church has continued to grow. It's been a lot of hard work. Uh, this next coming year, we're celebrating 10 years. Um, so in 10 years, been able to launch eight locations, uh, four to $5 million given away to missions. It's just amazing what God's done. And so many life change, so many life change stories that have just blown me away. So moved here with a six month old baby and now have five kids and a dog. So not only have I scaled the church, but scaled the family, built it all up. It's been a great journey. That's amazing. I know that many of our listeners have probably already aware of your story and are grateful for the influence that you are in our lives. So we just say thank you. Um, wow. Let's let's talk about scale. You said yep. something one time. I heard you say it. You said uh, we need to nail it before we scale it. And yep. so, l- give me a little bit more insight as to where that phrase came from and what it applies to, and how we can apply that to our own organizations. So, you know, with multiple services, multiple locations, um, every people always want more. And my thing is, is let's not duplicate mediocrity. So until we've got something good, let's make sure we don't keep adding to the plate. Um, I'll use my five kids, for example. My wife and I, we had one and we figured out, okay, we could do that. This turned out pretty good. She's a little cute. Let's try another one. So uh, you nail it till you scale it. So, uh, you know, don't go to two services until your first service. It, it's pretty solid. Um, you don't want double the amount of people experiencing a bad experience. So uh, that's our whole thing with that. A lot of people love multi-site. I love multi-site. I'm a huge fan of multi-site. I think it reaches uh, people effectively. But um, again, don't go to a second site until your first site doesn't have to be. I'm not even talking about capacity. I'm not even talking about amount of people. I'm just talking about quality. And so the old Chick-fil-A, you know, quote is don't worry about getting bigger, work about getting better. And if you will get better, your customers will demand that you get bigger. That's so great. that's my whole desire. Let's just keep making what we have better. That's awesome. Now, there were uh, four things that uh, we talked about that you wanted to scale in your life and in your leadership and in your organization. And the first one was how to scale prayer. Can you talk a little bit about how leading a church Obviously, yeah. uh, the demand is is high, but we can't leave out the power of prayer. So how have you scaled prayer in your own life? Yeah. Well, let me just say it this way. These, these four things, and I actually have a fifth one. These are the four things you do to scale any organization. So let me just break them down. So uh, the first one is prayer. So we don't do anything without prayer. We are people of prayer. So um, I don't want us to have prayer as like a response to our decision. I want us to pray and then make a decision. So your church has to be built off of prayer. So we launched our church out of 21 days of prayer and fasting. We still do seasons of prayer and fasting every year. We don't make decisions without praying. I won't do a meeting without praying. Um, Just prayer has to be the first thing we do. What prayer does is prayer leads the way for God to be first in the organization. So we say, God, this is yours. So before we scale anything, we're not going to, I'm not going to watch some TED talk and get inspired. I'm going to go to my prayer closet and get inspired. So if we want to scale, always start with prayer, like make sure that God's in it. I remember Rick Warren said at one time, he says, I don't want to uh, do something and ask the Lord to bless it. I want to find out what the Lord is blessing and I want to be part of it. So, so good. I thought, wow. What a great statement right there. Let, let me figure out where the Lord's already moving and I want to be part of that. So prayer positions us for God's power. And so uh, I'm going to start with prayer. Uh, so we're going to start with a project. So we actually have to put something in writing, like write the vision, make it clear. So people are always like, man, I just want this thing to grow. Well, what does that look like to you? What does that mean? Does it mean adding a service? Does it mean adding a location? Does it mean, you know, renovating your kid's space? We're going to write it down. And I really feel like, especially this next generation loves projects. Um, Previous generation was very big on, you know, they gave out of this faithfulness to God. Um, But I know that at least, you know, millennials and Gen Z, they love the fact of let me let me know what the project is that we're going towards. So um, I'm going to make the project real clear, um, and we can break these down a little bit more. Then I'm going to work on people. This is most important. You can't scale anything without the right people involved. Do you have the right people on the team? Uh, do you have the right leadership bench lined up? Um, I don't ever want to be the smartest guy at the table, so I'm going to make sure I de- I develop that table because you can't scale without the right people. Then I'm going to look for provision. It takes money to do ministry. And what I find most of the time is people can't scale something because they don't have the right people and they don't have the right money. So I think that's really crucial. We could talk about that one. And the last one, and I I added this one, but I've taught it before, is the idea of uh, you got to have peace. And here's what peace is. Peace is 
I'm happy with what God's given me and I'm going to live content. That's so I, I'm frustrated that I'm not where I think I should be. But you know what? Uh, my pastor told me this last week. He said, he said, Aaron, be satisfied with your portion. That's great. Ooh, that's, that's a great, so great phrase right there. Yes. Be satisfied with your portion. In other words, I, I, I'm going to strive for more, but I'm going to be satisfied where I'm at. And so those are, those are my five P's to scaling. That's awesome. Let's start with the first one. I know you have a pray first initiative. Uh, let's break that down a little bit more. I see those bracelets all around town. You see them everywhere in 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 Tampa. Whenever whenever I go to visit around the area, there's someone always has one on. Whether it's like the person at the smoothie place or at the gym or whatever. Um, how does that play out in your church? What are the times of the year where you initiate that and continue it? If I'm a pastor listening, how how would I start a prayer initiative? I think it needs to be both strategic and sporadic. I think both are very important. So it's going to be strategic. We put it on the calendar two uh, two times a year before growth seasons. So our our growth seasons end of January into February. So we're going to do it early January. Also, it's the start of the new year. We always start with fasting. Um, I think it's a really crucial. What Prayer and fasting are a powerful combination because prayer connects you with God, but fasting disconnects you from the world. So and good. the two together are supernatural. So, so I want to do both of them at the same time. It's like, uh, it just supercharges my walk with God. And it's most of the time I've done, I've had transition in my life. Most of the time that I've launched a new campus, it's always been the Lord gave me that vision during prayer and fasting. So I'm going to start in January. We always do it in August. I don't know about you. I mean, your church is way more spiritual uh, no. than mine is, but um, my church, we get in a summer slump in Florida. We kind of get out of our rhythms. We get off our diets. We, you know, our devotional life kind of gets in whack. You know, it gets a little weird. So I try to shake our church out of our summer slump and go, hey, August, let's go. Let's go after it. We actually did a thing this year called Seven Days of Revival and just sought God and wrote a version devotional and had the whole church go through it. So we're going to try that. But I also think it's important to have sporadic moments where you call the church to prayer. Yeah. There's something yeah. about the fact of, hey, we're in spiritual warfare right now. Uh, we got an election coming up, you know, or. You, we have uh, a, a crisis that's happening in our city. I'm going to call our church to prayer. Um, I sat down with our, our uh, managers the other day. These are people that oversee two or more employees at the church and just gave them a little bit of correction, a little bit of rebuke on the fact of, hey, I've, I've just done some digging. And I found out that multiple of you guys, even some of y'all have pastor before your name and you do your staff meetings and haven't opened up in prayer. That's a problem because prayer is the first thing we do in everything we do. That's great. So you you got to set that culture. But I'm not just going to talk in prayer. I'm going to listen in prayer. And uh, I, I tell you, it's it's phenomenal when I go before the church and say, hey, um, I went to the Lord in prayer and he told us to launch a campus here. Doesn't that mean more than, hey, I have a good idea, a good right. strategy? Right. So um, there's a quote, and I hope I don't botch it, basically says it's one thing to go before the people on behalf of God. It's another thing to go before God on behalf of your people. Wow. I want to so live great. that way. I want to Such go before God. God on behalf of my people and say, what is the Lord's vision? So you so, got to start in prayer. Let everything you do be, be birthed out of the prayer closet. Yeah. Such a good, a good um, perspective and something that we hear so often, but we do so <laughs> not, not often enough. And prayer so prayer is way easier to preach than it is to practice. Right. Right. Totally. Hey, this segment is brought to you by Compassion International. Connect your church with the life-giving ministry of Compassion by visiting Compassion.com slash Mike. That's Compassion.com slash Mike. When it comes to projects, let's talk to like a small church, um, you know, pastor. Maybe they got less than 200. They're trying to break the 200 barrier. And uh, they, they, they have the year-end you know, offering coming up, or they have a, they want to, you know, make an addition or knock down a wall in one of the kids' classrooms. How are you presenting projects? And if you're, if you scaled down and you wanted to grow your church, what would be the first thing you would do? So I, I think a crucial thing is that you never say that you have a need. People don't give towards need, they give towards vision. So I cast every project as a vision, not as a need. So we don't need to tear down a wall. We have a vision of reaching more kids. That's great. See the difference? Yes. So we don't have a need to fix our fellowship hall. We have a vision of providing more community in our church. So you've got it. Wording is everything. And pastors mess it up with their wording. So 
you know, I, I need to pay off our debt. You don't need to pay off your debt. You have a vision of being debt free. Right. So it's a big difference. So I cast every project as a vision. And um, so it's the, you know, old age old, you know, phrase, how do you how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And that's what you do. So you break it down into steps. So right now we're in a, a year in giving uh, season where, you know, we're developing. So whether that is, you know, $100,000 vision or a million dollar vision or $10,000 vision, you just need to know, people need to know where it goes, where it comes from. I actually think people will give if uh, if you're just honest with them. Like, right. Be very brutally honest. Like you can never go wrong with over communication. So, yeah. uh, so I'm going to break down the project, which means a miracle facility deals right now that are in the works and they'll be announced to our church in a few weeks, but I've been working for, on them for months. I mean, it's painful. And Mike, you know, that world, right? It's painful. It's a headache. It's I'm waking up at three. I'm tossing and turning about, oh man, well, what are the attorneys going to say today? It's frustrating. And the church will never have a clue. Right. But I'm going to come prepared when I present that project. That's excellent. Um, so we have prayer, we have projects, and we have people, right? The people that are on the team. Project. Um, we have the right person. The right person. Uh, let me, yeah, I, I think people is your most valuable asset you have. I mean, they're 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 incredible. Ministry. By the way, if you enjoy ministry and you don't like people. You're not called the ministry. Like right. ministry is people. We love people. We are uh, we serve God by serving His people. So um, you you got to love people, and you got to have the right people on the on the bus. And so you know, I thought it was really interesting. I had a breakfast this morning with a guy with our our pastor over all of our experience departments, all of our worship teams, everything. And I asked him how he got into ministry long ago, and he said. I was walking through, I went and visited a church. My friend invited me to, I walked into the foyer um, and attended the service. When I left the service, I, um, the pastor met me in the foyer and the pastor pulled me aside in the foyer and said, I've seen you on Instagram. Don't you, don't you uh, serve in a, uh, don't you play in a band? And he wow. said, yeah, I've toured with all these bands before. He goes, the guy spot me, put his arm around me and said, let's do lunch this week. And I thought, that's a great pastor. He's always spotting leaders. He's always figuring out who do who can I get. So I don't ever go into an environment without thinking who's the person that I'm trying to figure out and spot in here. So My great. guy, we're we're in a lots of cool environments. We're developing church planners and pastors. And I know how he works too, the same way. I'm always walking into one, one of those rooms going, I want to help other churches, but at the same time, there might be someone in here that needs to join my team. Right. And I'm always trying to spot leaders. Great leaders spot leaders all the time. It's not what you do. It's who can you spot? You know, that's always going to be your win. Your win will always be, it's not the ministry you do. It's who you raise. Always. It's not the ministry you do. It's who you raise. So, um, and I want to have more people than I need to uh, do the vision that God's called me to do, because I know the vision's bigger than the people I need right now. Second thing is, last thing is this on this, is making sure that you surround yourself with people that are able to correct you and give you a different perspective. Right. So the Lord and my church and the Tampa Bay area only needs one Aaron Burke. They only need, we only need one Mike Santiago. Right. But we've got to have, we're only a win if we have other people in our life who say, that's a terrible idea. Correct that. Because we're a body of Christ. And the pastor is a part of a bigger body of Christ. So if we think we're the only part, we'll miss it. And so I, I've worked hard on surrounding myself with people who correct me, who uh, say, have a voice in my life. Um, I've got friends of mine that serve on our executive team that'll sit there and say, hey, with all due respect, that's a, not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. You got to have those people. So it's all about people. It's always about people. And um, give, so give the me the side of scaling. You, you just can't grow. Like right now, we're, we're our plan is three campuses over the next year. Well, the only way you could do that is that that's three campus pastors, that's three children's pastors, that's three youth pastors, that's three worship pastors. It's that's that's a lot of people. So right. the only way we could do that is we have to have not three, we have to have 10 of each of those in the pipeline. 
Right. Because then you have 10 of each of those in the pipeline. You're going to find one or two that'll work in the next season. So you just got to think, I'd rather have big group that I'm pulling from and then have a smaller group and that smaller group. And that's how Jesus worked. Remember, he he fed the 5,000, but then he had a, the, the smaller groups around that. And then he had his 12 and then he had his three. And then, you know, it's always going to be that way. Right, right. How often do you meet with your executive team and on what day of the week are you doing that? So um, we have a whole strategy of what we do um, days of the week. So Super Bowl Sunday, we're a Sunday church. Uh, we we basically have a uh, message Monday for me. That's all sermon prep for the next week. Uh, we're Team Tuesday. So Team Tuesday is all about, we, we bring all of our central teams together. So all campuses, everybody said full meeting day, full high development. You've been here for part of that. Like it's it's a it's a phenomenal culture of bringing you know for us we have a hundred staff members, hundred staff members all together. It's awesome. Um, work on it Wednesday. So work on it Wednesday is I'm just trying to make things better. So today I'm meeting with different departments. Um, today's Wednesday, so we're working on ministry. And then Thursdays is my executive team meeting because that's think ahead Thursday. So I want to think strategic. Sunday's already done. Sunday's finished on Wednesday. So I'm thinking Thursday think ahead Thursday. And then uh, we have family Friday and we have Sabbath Saturday. That's so great. Love it. That was worth the price of admission right there. All right. We talked, I'm going to brand it eventually. That's right. We talked about uh, prayer. We talked about um, the people side. We talked about the project side. Now let's talk about provision, uh, stewardship. I mean, you got to raise it. Not only do you have to raise it, you have to steward it right. What are some key indicators on good stewardship for church leaders today? So, um, I mean, take care of what you got always. That's a biblical principle. Stewardship is biblical. Um, so we tell people, you know, how we spend money is a spiritual decision. It's a spiritual discipline. So we take care of what we got. And then um, we're not afraid to ask for more, but we're going to ask for more strategically. And we're going to let the Holy Spirit really lead people. Um, and so I, I, we're not going to manipulate people. I think the church is done with that season. You know, if you can give a thousand dollars, come up here and give your have pastor, will give you a handshake. That's weird. Right. Um, I think people have been so turned off by that. So we ask, we ask the church all the time. We say, Hey, this is the vision. It's going to cost $5,000. That's the vision. Um, and that vision, I believe God wants to supply for that vision. The provision is within the house. Um, so I'm going to ask you to pray. And I want you to genuinely pray. And I want you to ask God what he would have you do. We will never tell you what to give. We will unashamedly ask you to ask God what he would have you give. And so we've done that. And every time the provision has been there. So, so we take care of what we've got. We ask the people unashamedly to ask God. And then we report back. This one we did not do well for the first few years. Because we just assumed because we're taking care of what we got, we're good stewards. But the people don't know if we're good stewards. So if we told them we're going to raise $50,000 for a fence, then we need to tell them when the fence is done or if the fence is delayed six months because of shipping, you need to go before the church and just go, hey, just once you know, remember how y'all gave to that? Here's the update. So we had a massive hurricane go through South Florida. Church raised 100 grand right away, just given for that. So what I've been doing is constantly, hey, I know that money that you, the money that you gave is already put to work. Our team is doing this. Here's a family we helped because people need to see the fruit of their gift. So we wish that everybody had an eternal perspective because we know we can't always show the fruit of it. But when you can and the more you can update people, uh, the better they will trust you. I truly believe that giving in a church is always in proportion to their trust to the primary leader. I'll say it again, just so we're all saying the pitch. Giving in a church is always in proportion to their trust of the primary leader. That's so, so the big. The more they trust you, the more they'll get. And the only way for them to trust you is you got to prove that you're good to your word. So when we raise the money, we're going to reinforce where it's gone. We're going to be good stewards of it. And I mean, you don't have to talk about money all the time. I don't, I don't think, I think that's weird. You don't have to give long giving speeches. You just have to be a person of, 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 uh, integrity when it comes to that. So yes, being uh, trustworthy, is, yeah, being trustworthy is so important and, um, so important. it's the key. And 
Yeah, and and just the follow up. So we started uh, uh, sim, uh, uh, every six months. They uh, we send it out to all the givers of our church, like an impact report of our church. So hey, just want you to know, here's what your giving's going towards, and that's not for people that give tens of thousands of dollars. That's for people that give a hundred dollars to the church. Anybody, it's it's. I, I want people to know that their giving is making a difference, and so we started that because again. You can never go wrong with more updates. Just, hey, I'm just, I, people always will, will like, you'll never, our default is going to be that we're not going to communicate enough. So let's over communicate the vision over and over again. And I think if you take care of people's money, they'll give you more of it. Amen. I agree. That I if agree. you take care of it, you use it for kingdom purposes, you build the kingdom with it, people will give you more of it. That's great. Well, let's finish up our talk talking about peace. How do we scale? We need to have peace with our portion, right? We need to be satisfied with the portion we have. Satisfied with our portion. You know, yes. the Bible says that godliness with contentment is great game. I think it's very interesting because godliness is a pursuit. Contentment is a is a, uh, a a peace of mind. So how do you have peace yet pursue? So I think the whole thing is, is I'm always going to work hard. I'm always going to grind it out, hustle. I'm in that world. I'm I'm not going to buy into the whole like just sit back and just hopefully something happens. No, I, my you know we're up early, right? Hit the gym. We spend our time with God. I'm in the office. I'm one of the first people in the office. I'm one of the last ones to leave. You're never going to question my my work ethic, but I'm going to have a contentment with what God does because truly I can only do so much, and I'm going to ask the Lord to go whatever the results are after I've done my part. Let me be satisfied in it. So a um, part of that, just be real, is there's certain times I can't get on social media. Right. I can't. It bothers me. It bothers me when I get out of a service and we have an unbelievable, I'll tell you this, uh, we had a baptism service a year or so ago, and we had like a hundred and something people baptized in a single day. That for us was a huge deal. Huge. Huge. I was on cloud nine. And I serve as an overseer for another church. I got on social media and they had double the amount of baptisms that I had in that day. And they're a smaller church than we are, a lot smaller. And immediately my contentment was gone. Hmm. And I think that was a ploy of the enemy. Wow. Of like, do you see how the enemy immediately can take me focused off of the rejoicing with what God has done and gone, but you should be better. And all of a sudden I go, well, what are we doing? size wise we should have had more baptisms than that. It just is such a tactic of the enemy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do everything I can do. I'm going to trust God to do his part. And then I'm just going to have peace. Because honestly, you know what my kids need? My kids need a dad that's just joyful. That's good. That loves Jesus. That when we're when I'm on vacation or when I'm at home, I'm actually at home and I'm not in the office. And I'm not thinking about how do we get more baptisms next time? Right. So I just have peace. So um, I, personally, I'm in a very stressful season right now because there's a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of stuff going on. And last night, I had a little bit of time. The kids were at gymnastics doing some stuff, and I had a little bit of time to myself to just debrief, to relax. And then as soon as they came home, I go, all right, I'm going to walk in peace. I'm not even going to think about it. We went, not, we went swimming in the pool, hung out, had a great night together. And I'm like, you know what? My kids are always going to remember that. They're never going to remember, oh man, that was the season that that deal went through or that that staff member transitioned. Right. So anyway. We're in the process. It's important we live in that way. Yeah, we're in the process of uh, raising funds for our year-end offering, hosting dinners at the house and doing a bunch of stuff. And uh, my son had his first basketball tryout on Monday night. And I wanted to be the guy who picked him up from the tryouts to hear to be the first person to hear well, it ends at the same time the dinner begins. And I just decided that I was going to show up late to a dinner at my own house for the sake of being able to pick up my son from school, from the basketball tryout, just yeah. so that I, 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 cause I think you're right. It's like, are we trying to raise, uh, you know, three, $3 million, but what's he going to remember that I didn't send the intern to pick him up after basketball tryouts, after the biggest, you know, the first tryout of the year. Instead, his dad sh decided to show up late to his own party for the sake of for the sake of the kids, and I think that's important. I think that priorities could probably be another P that we add to the thing. Is like making sure you have 
priorities set in motion. And uh, Jim Elliott said it best, wherever you are, be you got to you got to be all there. Hey, thanks so much for joining me on the Mike Santiago show. I know that you have a podcast as well. It can be found on YouTube and uh, Spotify and wherever you find your podcast. What's the name of the podcast and where can people find it? Podcast is called Made for More. It's a leadership podcast I do once a month, just 20 minutes, some leadership content. Um, it's fun. And so uh, check it out. That's awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Pastor Aaron, for your time. We love you greatly and appreciate your influence on our lives. Hey, did you love the show today? You can really help me out by subscribing, giving us a five-star review, and hitting that like button. Commenting why you enjoyed today's episode, it's so helpful. The Mike Santiago Show is presented by Compassion International, produced by John Michael Sherman and the Rocket Media LLC. To find and follow Mike, all you have to do is go to the MikeSantiagoShow.com right now. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.